اعوذ باللہ من الشیطان الرجیم بسم اللہ الرحمن الرحیم صلی اللہ علیک یا سیدی و یا مولا یا رسول اللہ صلى الله عليك وعلى آلك المظلومين الغر الميامين روحي وأرواح العالمين لكم الفداء صلى الله عليك يا مولاي وابن مولاي يا أبا عبد الله يا رحمة الله الواسعة ويا باب نجاة الأمة غريب يا مظلوم كربلاء سيدي يا ليتنا كنا معكم فنفوز والله فوزا عظيما قال الله العظيم في محكم كتابه الكريم أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم ولقد آتينا لقمان الحكمة أنشكر لله آمنا بالله صدق الله العلي العظيم برای تعجیل فرج آقا امام الزمان صلوات بلندی رو بفرست It goes without saying that our religion is founded upon two firm and equally significant pillars. If one of these pillars collapses, then this structure becomes unsound. This structure becomes weakened and will come crumbling down. The first of these two pillars is the holy book of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is God's divine revelation. Revelation that is designed to illuminate the heart, awaken man's conscience and recalibrate our moral and ethical compass. It is also designed to bring about the way to achieving the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it includes a legal code as well as a moral and ethical one. The second pillar is that of the teachers of the Qur'an, that of those endowed with the knowledge of the Qur'an, those who are able to decipher the codes of the Qur'an, those who are able to expand and extrapolate the rulings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the teachings of the Almighty God to His creatures from the Qur'an. These are the household of purity, 
the household of infallibility, the household of the Messenger of God. Hence, the famous prophetic tradition, إِنِّي تَارِكُمْ فِيكُمُ الثَّقَلَيْنِ كِتَابَ اللَّهِ وَعِطْرَتِي أَهْلَ بَيْتِ And so, because our religion is founded upon these two pillars, when we read the Qur'an, it's important that we also refer to the instructions of the teachers of the Qur'an. Just as when you have a college textbook, a highly technical book that you study at college level, it's important that you listen to the lectures of your professor. It's important that you refer back to your lecture notes. Without those, people wouldn't need to go to college anymore. If you could just pick up the textbook, read it on your own, and become an expert in that discipline, in that field, why would you spend four years of your life and upwards of a hundred, hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars to go and get neck deep in debt to go to a university and to go to a college. Anyone could just pick up, not even the book, you could download the PDF, read it on your own and become an expert yourself. But of course, that's not how it works. You need the lecture notes, you need the lectures themselves, you need that engagement with your professor. So we come across a verse on the Qur'an in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says Alif Lam Meem Kaf Ha Ya Ayn Saad Ha Meem Ayn Sin Qaf These acronyms, these verses in the Qur'an that are commonly referred to as al huruful Mutaqatti'ah These are seemingly random disconnected letters found at the beginning of many chapters in the Qur'an. There is no way you could arrive at an acceptable and definitive definition of these acronyms without referring back to the, the teachers, the professors, those who have the key to unlocking the codes of the Qur'an, those who can decipher the secrets of these acronyms. Imam al-Hasan al-Askari in fact explicitly say, says this. He says that one of the reasons Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put the acronyms in the chapters of the Quran was to remind us that this is a textbook, not a newspaper. This is a highly technical and scientific work. And in order to understand it, you need to refer back to those who teach it, to those who have the knowledge of the Qur'an. So, the verse that I began the discussion for tonight is one in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَلَقَدْ آتَيْنَا لُقْمَانَ الْحِكْمَةِ We gave Luqman hikmah. Hikmah in the Arabic language is roughly translated as wisdom. You could say knowledge. But the verse doesn't go any further. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, as a result of this endowment, as a result of this bounty and gift that we gave to Luqman, we instructed him to be thankful, to be grateful, to express appreciation. So this is a great gift. Allah says in another verse, وَمَنْ يُؤْتَ الْحِكْمَةَ فَقَدْ أُوْتِيَ خَيْرًا كَثِيرًا Whoever receives wisdom, whoever receives hikmah, has indeed received an abundance of goodness, an abundant gift, a great and significant endowment has been given to him or her. But what is this wisdom? What does it exactly mean? What does it entail? Imam al-Sadiq, our sixth Imam, may God's peace and blessings be upon him, the teacher of the Qur'an, the professor who deciphers its codes and who unlocks its secrets, explains. 
he says al hikma ay annana atainahu ma'rifata imam zamanih wisdom was that we gave him knowledge of the imam of his time in other words the wisdom that luqman had was the ability to appreciate divinely appointed leadership it was the gift of getting to know that divinely appointed leader that would give him guidance and show him the way to acquiring and procuring the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The main difference, brothers and sisters, let me say this parenthetically before I move on. The main pivotal difference between us and ISIS and Boko Haram and Al Shabaab and Al Qaeda and all those Wahhabi terror groups. What is the difference between us and them? We pray and they pray. As a matter of fact, I don't know if you've seen them, but they pray in a much more meticulous manner. And by meticulous, I don't refer to the substance of prayer, to the essence of prayer. But at least on face value, you see their lines are all lined up properly. And that's something we often hear from brothers and sisters who are slightly confused, who come up to me and say, say it, look at their prayers, mashaAllah. Have you seen how meticulously they stand? Have you seen how they leave no gap between their feet? Have you seen how they pray in unison? And I say, these matters are important. We're not going to discount their importance, but they are trivial at best. These are peripheral issues. The main thing is the substance of prayer. The main thing is having obedience to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even when it seems when it seems that it's not in your best interest. And so we pray and they pray. We fast, they fast. We go to Hajj, they go to Hajj. So what's the problem? How is it that they turn into barbaric, monstrous, vicious murderers? while we happen to be at the receiving end of their terrorism. We are constantly victimized and they are constantly victimizing us. And the answer is this, while the branches of religion are important, the single most important thing that solidifies these branches and turns Islam from a ritualistic tradition into a soulful means of submission is Imam. The difference lies in whether or not we subscribe to God's divine leadership or leadership that we pick for ourselves or people that we appoint ourselves, whether it be a monarch or someone who claims to be the Khalifa in the 21st century. The difference between us and them is that we subscribe to the Imam that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes in the Quran when he says that after Prophet Ibrahim passed all of those incredibly arduous and difficult tests, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then appointed him as an Imam. So the next stage after prophethood is Imam. So that's the main difference. So when the Quran says that we gave Luqman wisdom for which he must forever be grateful, it makes perfect sense that that wisdom is knowing the Imam of our time. Brothers and sisters, the season of mourning isn't over, but for many people, this was the most intense period of lamentation, of remembrance, of recalling the tragedies of Imam al Hussein and the Ahlul Bayt. Let us now 
use that passion, that energy, that drive, that knowledge that we've acquired, that spiritual boost that we were blessed with in these days and in these nights to take our spirituality to the next level. And the only way we can do that is by going through the Imam of our time. Brothers and sisters, the Imam of our time is the Hussein of our time. In fact, don't take my word for it. The Hadith says that when the 12th Imam, the awaited Savior, reappears, يُسْنِدُ ظَهْرَهُ إِلَى الْكَعْبَةِ The first order of business, the very first step that he takes when he emerges in the holy city of Mecca is that he rests his back against the Kaaba, And then he says, مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ آدَمَ وَشِيثْ فَهَا أَنَا آدَمُ وَشِيثْ مَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَىٰ إِبْرَاهِيمْ وَإِسْمَاعِيلْ فَهَا أَنَا إِبْرَاهِيمْ وَإِسْمَاعِيلْ Whoever wants to look at the prophets, the apostles of Allah, here is the apostle of Allah. Here are Ibrahim, Ismail, Adam, Sheikh, Musa, Isa, Nuh. Then he says, Woman Arada and Yandur, Ila Rasulillahi Muhammad, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Woman Arada and Yandur, Ila Ali and Amir al Mu'minin, Faha and Ali. وَمَنْ أَرَادَ أَنْ يَنْظُرْ إِلَى الْحَسَنِ وَالْحُسَيْنِ فَهَا أَنَا ذَا الْحَسَنُ وَالْحُسَيْنِ You want to see Imam Al-Husayn? Here I am. It's a mistake. Don't get me wrong. It's a mistake for us to fall into the trap of trying to compare and contrast the members of the Ahlul Bayt. To compare the Imams and try to figure out who's more important because at the end of the day كُلُّكُمْ نُورٌ واحد. They are beams of light emanating from the very same source. But if we go by the traditions of the Imams themselves and if we were to rank the members of the Ahlul Bayt without a doubt the number one would be the Messenger of Allah. The second would be the commander of the faithful. And Fatima to Zahra, Imam al Hassan, Imam al Hussein, and then it is our 12th Imam. Why do I say that? The companions of Imam al Sadiq say we walked in on the Imam one day. I believe the hadith states that it was a day of Eid, a day of celebration, a day of festivity when people are supposed to be happy and yet they say we walked in only to see our master Imam Sadiq crying, sobbing in the state of prostration and sujood and saying these words Sayyidi ghaybatuka nafat ruqadi my master in reference to Imam Zaman Imam Sadiq labels him as his master and then he says, your occultation, your disappearance has stripped me from any comfort. I cannot even sleep the night in comfort with you in occultation. In fact, the commander of the faithful says in a hadith, Wa shawqah li Oh, the eagerness. To see him, to see the 12th Imam. How eager am I to see his companions? The 12th Imam, brothers and sisters, we are blessed beyond words and beyond description for being among those who believe in him, who love him, who remember him, and to even be in his time, in his presence, for he is the epitome, the culmination, the perfection of all previous divine revelations, as well as the eventuality 
of everything that the Ahlul Bayt stood for. Everything that the Imams strived for. Imam al-Zaman will be the one who brings all of that to fruition. Imam al-Zaman is the one who epitomizes and personifies all of those great ideals and values and principles. And so it's important that, especially now that we have gone through this period of mourning, we have sought nearness to Aba Abdullah al Hussein. We have cleansed our souls through those sacred tears that flowed out of our eyes. And even if you couldn't cry, the hearts that were broken for the tragedy of Aba Abdullah al Hussein, Imam al Sadiq prays for those hearts. Imam al Sadiq says, Allahumma arham tilka sarkhata allati kanat lana. Oh Allah, bless that scream that emanates for our sake. Those tears that flow out of sorrow and sadness for our tragedies. The Imam blesses every single breath that comes out of your mouth while you're in the state of mourning and lamentation for the tragedies of the Imams and in particular those of Imam al Hussein alayhi salam. And having gone through this period of cleansing, you know how people every once in a while, there's a new diet, fad, and people go into these cleansers and whatnot. Well, this is our cleanser. Muharram is our cleanser. Muharram is a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes these souls which for a year were occupied by material things for an entire year. We might have been distracted, but it's in these days and nights that your soul becomes transparent as crystal, becomes so clear. Suddenly your prayers have a different taste. Your acts of worship have an entirely different meaning because you've cleansed that soul, you've cleansed that heart. And now that the heart has been cleansed, brothers and sisters, now is the time to turn our attention to Imam al-Zaman. Now is the time for us to remember him, to think of him. It is said that one of the scholars who had access to the Imam, who could see him, perhaps it was a Sayyid ibn Ta'us, or others, I don't know. I do know that Sayyid ibn Ta'us had the honor of visiting the Imam on numerous occasions. And in fact, he was able to detect the Imam's vocal tones. He knew the Imam's voice if he heard it even from afar. But regardless of who it was, it is said that this person who was in frequent contact with him one day the Imam asked him a question. He said to him, if this relationship was ever severed, if your communication with us came to an end, if you couldn't see us anymore, what would happen to you? He said, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I would die. I can't imagine myself being distanced from you not being able to speak to you, not being able to communicate with you. The Imam said to him, that is exactly why you get to communicate with us. If you get to the point where you can't live with, without the Imam, you'll be able to see the Imam. The problem is, while we all love him, whilst we all call on to him, while we yearn to see him and we recite Dua Al Faraj, Dua Al Nudba, which, by the way, brothers and sisters, it is a highly recommended Dua. Friday mornings is the time we remember the Imam. We say in the Dua, in Salatul Jum'ah, in the Qunut, this is one of the recommended prayers, right? هذا يومك المتوقع فيه ظهورك والفرج للمؤمنين على يدك 
Ya Hujjat ibn al Hasan, this is your day when we anticipate your reappearance. This is the day which shall bring relief to your lovers and your followers. Aina Mu'azzul Mu'mineen wa Mudhillul Kafireen. To recite Dua Nudba on Friday mornings. I know we live in a world where everybody's living their life on the fast lane, as they say. It's a hustle, it's difficult. People go to work. But so do many people in other parts of the world. They make it work. They recite Dua Nudba early in the morning, 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m., before you go to work. I highly recommend that whenever you can, as a community, if not as a community, as a family, get together in your own homes and recite this dua. Remember the Imam to show how eager we are. He said that if you couldn't speak to us, what would happen? He said, I would die. He said, that is why you can speak to us. That is why you can communicate with us. We're just not desperate enough, brothers and sisters, is the point I'm trying to make. Are you desperate for him? Are you hopeless to the point where you call out his name and no one else's? Or do you have a plan B and a plan C all the time? Is he your only exit strategy? Or do you have other exit strategies schemed and plotted? Like Abdahak, whose name we mentioned a couple of nights ago, who had brought a horse with him to Karbala, and he had hidden that horse in time for when the going gets tough, says to the Imam that it doesn't look like I'm going to be able to be of any help or assistance. Can I go? The Imam said to him, sure, but where is your horse? He said, I've got a horse. If you have a horse lined up, if you have an exit strategy waiting for you, then you're not desperate enough. You're not eager enough. In Arabic, there is an expression. Listen, the expression says, there was a tradition, let me try and provide some context so you understand what this means. It's a beautiful idiom. They had a tradition in tribal Arabia where if someone died, they would pay people to come and cry and weep and scream in the funeral so as to make the deceased look like a really special person. They still have that practice in South Korea. I saw a report about that and maybe some other cultures, I don't know. But this was practiced by Arabs back in the day. So Arabs devised this expression they said a truly bereaved mother who has lost her child doesn't cry the way someone who was hired to cry cries. Am I right? You're just, it's just not the same. The one who has lost her child, the one who has lost her husband, the one who, are, who has lost her father cries with bitterness sobs in an authentic, genuine manner. These are real tears, not crocodile tears. But if you're paid to cry, you can fake it. Actors cry and they have all these crocodile tears on the screen all the time. But it's just not the same. As a matter of fact, I was reading a study which says that the chemical composition of the tears is different. You can actually analyze those tears and there are different levels of salt and other chemicals in genuine tears than there are in fake tears. Our tears for Imam al-Zaman, for the most part, and I'm talking about myself, I am sure you're all much, much better than I am. And I'm not saying this to act humble. But my tears are crocodile tears. 
They're not real tears. I haven't reached that level of true hopelessness, desperation, yearning and eagerness to see the Imam. If we did, things would be very different. If we cried for him the way a grieving, bereaved mother would cry for her child, we would meet the Imam. We would lead our lives in a completely different way. Now, wouldn't we? All these people who have met the Imam. There is one overriding theme across the lives of those privileged to have ever set their eyes on the luminous forehead of the Imam. May Allah hasten his reappearance. That overriding theme, that consistent common denominator that you find in all of these individuals was their piety, number one. And number two, it was their eagerness. It was the fact that they had severed all hope from everybody else. It was the fact that the Imam was their last remaining hope in this world. They recognized that without the Imam, they could never seek nearness to Allah, nor could they lead a life that is free from troubles and problems and tribulations. You have to recognize that without the Imam who acts like the pillar of the universe. Have you seen the position of the sun vis-a-vis -vis the solar system? When the Holy Messenger of Allah says, let's not be superficial brothers and sisters. Let's dig a little deeper and try to understand. When the Prophet says, shams, he, His likeness is like that of the sun. When covered by the clouds. Let's try and understand what the Prophet is saying. When the sun is covered by the cloud, yes, there is still light. More importantly, if we didn't have the sun, if the sun wasn't there, with or without clouds, if the sun was not there, our planet, our entire solar system, would go spinning out of control into infinity. Our planet wouldn't have anything to use as its axis. It would spin out of control. Imagine if somebody lost contact with their spaceship in outer space. It's the most scary thought, honestly, to just spin completely out of control, to not have that gravitational pull that can bring you back. Without Imam Zaman, we would all be spinning out of control and be members of ISIS and other terror groups. That's why they are the way they are. Without the Imam of our time, we would have no moral compass. We would have no guidance. We would have no way to know what is true and what is false. Until you reach that level of gnosis and understanding, your tears will not be genuine tears. <coughs> Ali ibn Mahziyar, whose story I am sure you've heard from these esteemed scholars and others. May Allah bless them and prolong their lives. A man who goes to Hajj for 10 years shows what eagerness is like. This is what happens when you're eager. This is what happens when you're in love. Have you never been in love? When you're in love, the only thing that occupies your mind is the beloved. 24-7 there is an obsession about the beloved. You can never get them out of your mind. Ali ibn Mahziyar goes to Hajj in order to meet the Imam once and twice and thrice and ten times. Allahu Akbar. Until he says to himself, he doesn't give up on seeing the Imam. He doesn't blame the Imam for blocking access to him. 
There's a reason why these people became who they are. Do you know what he says? He says, I am not worthy of seeing him. If I were, by now he would have allowed me some access. He would have let me see him even if it were just once. And so that year he tells the caravan, it doesn't look like I'll be joining you this time. Go on on your own. He goes to bed in his dream. He sees someone who comes to him and says, Come, Ya Ali ibn Mahziyar, come, go to Hajj. We, you will get what you have sought this time around. So he wakes up in the morning. He asks about the caravan. He's told that the caravan has already left the city. Runs after the caravan until he reaches them and he says, I've changed my mind. I wish to come along with you. It looks like finally after 10 years of hard toil and struggle, I'll be able to, to receive that, that most prized of all possessions. He goes along with them. Long story short, it's a beautiful, very nuanced and detailed story with many, many lessons. But this is the short version. He goes along with them, arrives in Mecca. As he's doing tawaf, he says, a young man approached me. He said to me, you are Ali ibn Mahziyar. Come, I have the one you are seeking. So he takes me, we cross, we exit the city of Mecca. We cross valleys and mountain ranges, ranges until we get to this cliff. He says to me, you see the top of that cliff? I looked at it, there was a tent. And from that tent, there was a bright beam of light. He said to me, that is your destination. This is where you need to go to. He says, I went up. I asked permission. I entered. Now imagine the state of mind that Ali ibn Mahziyar is. Imagine the eagerness. Imagine that shawq, that love which drove him from his town and city to Hajj. 11 times in order to meet his master. What is going through his mind? I have no idea. Only a true lover will understand what another lover is going through. He says, I entered. I saw the Imam sitting on the floor with his finger, his index finger in the sand. As soon as he saw me, he said, Ya Abu al-Hasan, Ya Ali ibn Mahziya, Inna kunna nantadhiruka sabahan wa masa'a. I have been waiting for you day and night. Eleven years, where have you been? He says to him, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, I didn't have access to you. No one was there to guide me to you. He said, no one was there to guide you? He said to him, no, that's not it. Ya Ali ibn Mahziyar, you were occupied with money and wealth and living your life. That's what blocked your access to us. I've been waiting for you. Where have you been? The Imam says to Shaykh al-Mufid in his letter to him, and he says in other letters, the letters of the Imam must be read, brothers and sisters. Look them up online. Try and read them. Try and make out whatever you can from them. There are some messages embedded deeply in those letters which are great lessons in and of themselves. In one of those letters, the Imam says that had it not been for the sins committed by our followers, لَتَعَجَّلَ لَهُمُ الْيُمْنُ بِلِقَاعِنَا had it not been for those sins, you would have been able to see us. You would have been able to meet us. But it's those sins that create barriers. It's those sins that put up curtains. And you can't see the beauty that is the Imam of your time, the representative, the vicegerent of God Almighty on earth. It's these sins that don't let you open your heart and open your eyes. Though at the same time, the Imam, you know what he says? He says, don't think that we have forgotten about you. Don't think that we have abandoned you. Don't think that we have forsaken our followers. We are always thinking of you. We're always looking after you. Adjusting your path in ways that you don't even know. 
You're not even paying any attention to this. But we adjust your paths. We make changes to your lives so as to avoid major obstacles, so as to avoid falling into the traps of shaitan. And the more you think of the Imam, the more you try and connect with him, the more you pay sadaqah on his behalf, the more you try and reach out, the more the Imam looks after you as well. That connection needs to be established first. The Imam says, we care for you. One day, a man by the name of Rubay'ah, who was one of the companions of Amir al-Mu'mineen, Al-Qasim ibn Muhammad ibn Abi Bakr, who was a companion of the Imam, he narrates the story from Rubay'ah. Rubay'ah says, I got sick. And my illness was so severe that I didn't go to the mosque. I didn't go to visit the commander of the faithful for several weeks. He says, I was bed bound. I stayed at home until one day my sickness was relieved all so slightly. I was feeling just a little bit better on a particular Friday. He says, thoughts, I thought to myself, there is nothing better I can do than to go to the mosque, listen to the commander of the faithful, give his Friday sermon, then pray behind him. That is the best I can do now that I can walk. So I performed Ghusl al-Jum'ah, I left, I went to the mosque, I listened to the Imam's sermon, I prayed behind him, then I felt sick again. My sickness came back. So the Imam finished his prayer. He walked out of the mosque. I walked after him. So he says, as I was walking behind the Imam, he looked at me. He said to me, Ya Rubay'ah, I see that you have been sick for a few weeks. You haven't come to the Friday prayers. I believe that you have been very ill and you couldn't come to the mosque until this morning when you felt a little bit better. So you thought to yourself, there is nothing better I can do than perform ghusl, go listen to the Imam's sermon, pray behind him. So you came, you performed your ghusl, you prayed behind me, you listened to the sermon, and then you felt bad again, and now you're walking behind me. He said, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen, Wallah ma adawta qissati abada. This is exactly what happened to me, Ya Amir al Mu'mineen. How do you know these things? So the Imam said to him, and this is what I want you you to pay attention to. The Imam said to him, Ya Rubay'a, inna al-wahida min shi'atina, when one of our lovers and followers and partisans, ma yamradu minhum ahadun illa maridhna li maradih. When one of them gets sick, by God, we get sick as well. When you suffer any pain, I suffer that pain. When you pray to Allah, وَمَا دَعَا مِنْهُمْ أَحَدٌ إِلَّا أَمَّنَّا عَلَىٰ دُعَائِهِ When you pray to Allah, we say, Ameen, asking God to fulfill your wish, to grant you your desires. He said, Ya Amir al-Mu'mineen, is this only for the people who live around you? In other words, do you have to be close to the person to know what they're going through, to sympathize with them? to empathize with them. If they fall sick, you fall sick. Is that only with people who are within a close proximity to you? Or does that include every Shia? The Imam said to him, it includes every one of our Shia, every one of our followers. And so brothers and sisters, the Imam of our time feels the exact same way. When one of us gets sick, he gets sick. We don't have a lot of time to illustrate the sense of desperation. What you need to get to in order to be privileged and honored to experience the existence of the Imam. Because scholars have mentioned at least 50 obligations we have towards Imam of our time. But of the 50, and there are many of course, perhaps the most important one is to feel his presence. In other words, don't think of the Imam as a 1 plus 1 equals 2 kind of mathematical equation. 
We all know the Imam exists. We believe he exists based on verses of the Quran and traditions of the Prophet, as well as logical deductions. But that's not enough. You need to feel his existence. You need to recognize that he is here. Ayatollah Sheikh Ismail Namazi was one of the senior scholars in the Hawza in Mashhad. He was a brother, you might recognize his name perhaps, a brother to Ayatollah Sheikh Ali Namazi. Sheikh Ali Namazi is the author of a book called Mustadrak Safinatul Bihar, an excellent resource for anyone who can read Arabic. And perhaps there's a Farsi version available, I am not sure. But if you can read Arabic and if you are looking for an introductory book on hadith and on the traditions of the Ahlul Bayt, look up this book, Mustadrak Safinat al Bihar, which is an index of Bihar al Anwar. Not only is it an index, but he has selected certain traditions and beautiful ahadith and included them in that index and he has even provided some commentary. Absolutely great resource. His brother is the one to whom the story takes place. He's the central character of this story. Ayatollah Sheikh Ismail Namazi, remember this name. Sheikh Ismail tells the story to several of his students and his contemporaries. But if that weren't enough, he is actually recorded on video telling the story. It's on YouTube and he speaks in Farsi. So look him up, Ayatollah Sheikh Ismail Namazi. The story goes something like this. In 1956, he decides to go to Hajj from Mashhad, the holy city of Mashhad, to the Atabat, Atabat Aliyat, as they say, in Mecca and in Medina. And so he goes with a particular caravan. This caravan consisted of a bus filled with pilgrims who stay together from beginning to end, from the start of the journey until their return back to Mashhad. And they also would go through Iraq after performing the pilgrimage to Hajj. So after Mecca and Medina, they'd go to Karbala, Najaf, Samarra, Kazamin. So he left with this caravan. The caravan had a, a driver, the bus had a driver and a, an assistant driver. The driver's name was Mahmoud Agha. The assistant driver's name, this is relevant, the assistant driver's name was Asghar Agha. He says that on the onward journey from Mashhad to Hijaz, to Mecca and Medina, Mahmoud Agha was the main driver. He says, we went, we performed Hajj, we performed the rituals of the pilgrimage, we went to Medina, now we're getting ready to head towards Iraq. To go to Iraq from Medina, from Mecca, you have to go through a stretch of desert called Ar-Rub'ul Khali, the empty quarter. The empty quarter, you can look it up on Wikipedia, it is the largest contiguous desert stretch in the world. It stretches more than 250,000 miles, a thousand miles, 500 miles across and 200 miles or 250 uh, and it's a massive stretch of land it has hills it has valleys it goes up and it goes down but the one common denominator throughout this desert is that it's filled with sand and the sands keep shifting because there are sandstorms and so it doesn't have one single appearance to it. It keeps changing its appearance. One day there is a cliff here, the next day it's completely gone because the wind moves the sand and shifts it around. He says, on the way back, we got on the bus and the authorities back then would bring together a hundred buses together so they could all travel at the same time. Sending one bus on its own would be too risky. Two buses 
a little risky. So instead they would bring and combine a hundred buses and they would be a contingent that traveled through the empty quarter, this massive desert. He says, so we got into our bus. Mahmoud Agha, who was the main driver, he drove the bus for a while, then he got tired. Asghar Agha said, let me drive. So he takes command of the vehicle. Because they were one of a hundred buses, they happened to be at all the way in the back. So Asghar Agha was probably a younger man who got bored, felt that the buses ahead were driving too slowly. He said, you know what? I'm going to overtake these buses. So he started driving faster and faster until he overtook all of the buses, but continued to drive at a very fast speed. Ayatollah Sheikh Ismail Namazi says, I kept telling him, don't do this, stick together, wait for the other buses, don't go on your own. But he kept saying, no, it's okay, we have enough fuel, we have enough gas, we have water, we have food, there's nothing to be worried about. And we know this is the asphalt road and it takes us all the way to the Iraqi Hijazi border. There's nothing to be worried about. But because of the sandstorms and because of the shifting landscape, the sand covered the asphalt. Now you're in the middle of the biggest contiguous desert in the world and you don't know where the road is. He, Asghar Agha, kept telling them, but that's still okay, we'll manage because we can, I can guess the direction we need to keep going and I'll keep going that way. So they say that they kept going and going and going and going until it was Maghrib time. They have no idea where the main road is. They have no idea which way they're going. They've already traveled a couple of hundred miles and there's no sign of the border. They should have reached the border by this time. Ayatollah Namazi says, I told him, you know what? Stop. It's getting dark out. Let's camp and let's spend the night out here before we run out of fuel and we run out of water. Because the biggest danger is not only that we get lost, but we run out of these things. If the bus stops, what are we going to do in the middle of the desert? There's no one to be found, nothing to be seen. He says, so we stopped the bus, we camped out. We spent the night in fear and anxiety. He says, then early in the morning, we got up, we prayed Salat al-Fajr, we got back on the buses and we started driving again. The more we drove, the more it felt like we were going nowhere. He says, until it was almost Dhuhr time when our fuel tank became empty. Now here we are, no fuel, no gas, and with dwindling water supplies. The water we had should have lasted us half a day until we get to the border, but our water is almost finished. He says, we got out of the bus, I told everyone, you know what? This is the time we need to do tawassul ba'agha Imam Zama. There is no other respite. There is no other way out. Let us pray to the Imam. Soon after that, within a couple of hours, the sun and its scorching heat hitting our scalps like nothing else, burning us, the water finished. Allahu Akbar. Ya Imam al-Zaman, Ya Faris al-Hijaz, Ya Hujjat ibn al-Hasan. We began crying, we began weeping <coughs> until darkness fell. He says, when it was close to Maghrib, I said to them, brothers, I don't want you to lose hope, but it looks like we are hopeless. How are we gonna spend the night here? All alone in the middle of the desert, no water, Nothing. We had a little bit of food left, but what, what do you do with food when you don't have water? He said, you know what? I'll tell you this. Let's all dig our own graves so that at least we sleep in those graves and the animals, the scavengers, the beasts don't come and eat our flesh in the night. 
If we're going to die, let's at least die in our graves and be covered by the shifting sands, then become food for these animals of the desert. So we dug our graves. Now imagine when you've dug your grave, you've reached the state of desperation. At that point, you are truly hopeless. So when you turn to Imam al-Zaman and call out, Ya Hujjat ibn al-Hasan, when you recite Dua al-Faraj, you do so like a truly grieving, bereaved mother who has lost her child. Not someone who thinks of the Imam every once in a while. He, so sa he says that with our graves dug, we spent the night in prayer, invoking the name of the Imam, supplicating to him until it was close to Fajr. He says, when Fajr struck, I had left the group. I didn't want to be seen crying and weeping and sobbing. So I had gone a little further out to cry and beseech the Imam of our time. He says, suddenly I looked up and there was a, a Bedouin man approaching from nowhere, out of the blue as they say. A Bedouin man approaching with 12 camels. He says, to me this was very strange, but not strange enough to be occupied with the idea that we are in the middle of the desert, there's no civilization to be seen anywhere near. Where is this man coming from? Where is he headed to? I had no idea, but I had my own problems. He says, as soon as I saw him, I walked up to him. I said, Assalamu Alaikum. He replied by saying, Wa alaykum as salam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. He then says, I looked at him. He was the most beautiful person I had ever seen. I saw his khal, he said. I saw the whiteness of his face. I saw that beautiful flowing beard of his. And even though he dressed like a Bedouin, he looked nothing like a Bedouin. Those desert dwelling Bedouins in the empty quarter usually have a very dark complexion. And yet he looked very different. He says, but that wasn't enough to provoke any curiosity. Again, I was occupied with my own problems. He says, because Ayatollah Namazi had spent time in Iraq, he had studied in Najaf, he spoke with an Iraqi accent. And those of you who speak Arabic know that Iraqi accent is distinct from Hijazi accent. Sometimes they have difficulty communicating, difficulty understanding each other. And we have a hadith that the Imam of our, of our time would speak to people in their own dialect, in their own language. We have a hadith where the Imam spoke to a, a man from Iran with a Mashhadi Persian accent. We have a hadith where the Imam would speak in a Syrian and Lebanese accent to those who were Syrian and Lebanese from Sham. We have a hadith that the Imam spoke in Hebrew. The Imam spoke in different languages depending on who he was talking to. So Ayatollah Namazi says that I told him Ihlam in an Iraqi dialect. We're lost. So he says immediately, he said, Ana jaya dalikum in an Iraqi accent, I'm here to show you the way. He says, so I told him, where is the way? What do we do? He said, here is what you do. Sheikh Ismail. He mentioned my name. He said, Sheikh Ismail, go to the bus driver. First off, don't let Asgharagha drive. <laughs> because it was his fault that you ended up where you are. Ask Mahmoud Agha to be the driver, number one. Number two, again, he's, he should be mesmerized, but again, he's occupied with survival. He said, number two, one of the things that they had done, they had made an intention when they were in the state of desperation, beseeching Imam al-Zaman, they all came to an agreement, I forgot to mention this, that if they could survive this ordeal, they would take all of their money, all of their possessions and give it in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and lead a life of virtue, a life of purity, avoid any and all sins. The Imam 
or this man said to Sheikh Ismail, he said to him, go tell your friends not to give all of their money and their possessions as soon as they make it out of this alive. Because you're now headed towards Iraq. You're going to Karbala and Najaf and Samarra. You will need this money. You will need to spend on this journey. So tell them to keep this money even though they have made a nether. This nether is not acceptable. Keep your money until you get back to Mashhad. When you go there, you can give money in the way of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala all you want, but not now. So that's number two. Number three, he said, you see those two mountains? If you go through those two mountains and turn left, you will find the border between Hijaz and Iraq. Go there. This is, what, this is where you intended to go. And wait there, your caravan with the 99 other buses will arrive tomorrow. And you will in fact get there before they do. He says, so I went back to the group. I told him, I told them that this is what this man is telling us. This is the way. This is what you need to do. This is who the driver is. Let's go. He says, but my group told me, having gone through that phase, that period of fear for your life, they said, could you please ask him, because you can speak Arabic, ask him to join us, to come along with us in case we get lost again. Let him take us to the border. Uh, let's have him come with us to the border and then he can leave us. He says, I walked up to him. I took a copy of the Quran that I had. I said to him, oh man, I beg you in the name of this Quran that you come along with us. We're too afraid. He said, the man told me, why did you have to swear in the name of the Quran? I would have come to you. I would have come with you anyway. You didn't have to speak like this. I'll come. It's okay. He says, so he came along with us. He got on the bus. He told Mahmoud Agha, turn on the ignition. He turned it on. We started driving towards those two mountains. Remember, the car had no fuel. Remember, the car's engines had failed. He says, I did not think of that. All I could see was a stranger coming to our rescue, Anajaya Dalikum, showing us the way, telling us to do things, and we were doing as he instructed. We drove and drove and drove until we arrived between those two mountains, through that valley. We turned left as he had instructed us. We saw the border, we got out of the car. He says, when we got out of the car, we were overjoyed, we were in a festive mood, we were praying to Allah, Alhamdulillah, Salawat, this, that. So then we took out some food that we had. We started eating and we offered the food to this stranger. He says, I offered him some food, he refused to eat with the utmost politeness, but he said, I can't have any. Others offered some nuts and fruits and what have you. Again, he said, I cannot have this food. He didn't eat from our food, but he said, you are where you wanted to be. So head back to where you came from. He said, so I went up to him. I said to him, could you please stay with us until our buses arrive? He said, I would, but I have a lot of things I need to do, a lot of things I need to attend to, a lot of people I need to look after. So I have to leave you here. So he bid us farewell. I looked to one side for a second, then I looked back only to see that he was gone. As soon as he disappeared, I started asking myself these questions. How did he know my name? Why did he speak with an Iraqi accent? How did he get the bus moving? How did he know that we had made that nadr? How did he know the way out of that predicament? Where did he emerge from? Who is this man? I began crying and remembered the Imam of our time, beating my head, saying, how, how hopeless am I that the Imam would come to me and I don't recognize him? How miserable, how unfortunate am I? that I would see the Imam, but not be able to connect with him as the Imam of my time. Brothers and sisters, we have to be desperate. We have to recognize that we have no helper, we have no master. 
ما آقا داریم برادران خواهران آقای ما امام زمان ماست حسین زمان ما حجت ابن الحسن عسکریه این آقای ماست مشکلی داری کاری داری گریه از آقات بخوا توسل بکن توجه بکن اونا آقای خودشون رو میکنن یا حجت ابن الحسن حالا این روزا روزایی که حضرت روز و شب گریه میکنه فلا بكين عليك صباحا ومساء فلا اندبنك صباحا ومساء يا جداه يا ابا عبد الله ولا ابكين عليك بدل الدموع دما فرمایش امام رضا هم هست امام رضا فرمود که ان یوم الحسین اقرح جفوننا چشامون زخمی شده از بس که برای آقا امام حسین گریه کردی به امام زمان چشماشون زخمیه این روزا یادمون باشه یه صدقه بدیم برای سلامتی آقا امام زمان خیلی دلشون خونیه آه یا مولا یا حجت ابن الحسن المهدی عجل الله فرجك همین رو بگیم عبارت دعای ندبس با هم دیگه بخونیم زمزمه کنید اینا طالب بدم المقتول بكربلا بار دیگه بگو عین الطالب بدم المقتول بكربلا عین الطالب بدم المقتول بكربلا آمد خدمت آقا امام زین العابدین عرض کرد یا ابن رسول الله شما مصیبت زیاد دیدین داغ زیاد دیدین ولی کدام یکی از اون مصیبت ها برای شما سختتر بود آیا اون وقتی بود که عموتون عباس رو زمین افتاد و سهم و نابتون فی عینه آیا اون وقتی بود که علی اکبر روی خاک کربلا افتاد مقطعا اربا اربا آیا اون وقتی بود که آقا امام حسین علی از غرشو به خیمه ها آیا اون زمانی بود که سید شهدا از روی از بشون به زمین افتاد حضرت فرمودن همه این مصیبت ها مصیبت های بزرگیه ولی خیر هیچ کدوم از اینا نبود فرمودن اشام 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 
شام از همه بدتر بود آخه میدونی چرا چون که وقتی ما رو بردن تو شام هم به طرف ما سنگ مینداختن هم به ما ناسزا میگفتن ولی از همه بدتر این بود که به پدرم امیر المؤمنین هم فاش میدادن یکی میگه از اونایی بود که سرپرستی کاروان به عهده اون بود میگه وقتی من رسیدم یه خورده دیر رسیدم به کاخ یزید ملعون میگه اونجا وقتی رسیدم یه نگاه کردم دیدم مرمر در کاخ یزید پر رد پای خونیه رد پای بزرگ رد پای کوچیک ولی همش خونی بود همه بگید مظلوم حسین مظلوم حسین بردنشون به خرابه شام اون شب اول خیلی خواب دیدن عزیزانشون رو دیدن حضرت اول فضل رو دیدن ولی از اون خوابایی که نقل میکنن تو هیچ کدومشون من ندیدم که میگن شکایت میکنن که ما رو زدن ما رو اذیت کردن همه اونایی که خواب دیدن همشون میگفتن که امه زینب و کتک زدن امه سادات و عذیت کردن مظلوم حسین آی چقدر نانجیب بودن اینا چقدر بی انصاف بودن آخه یه بچه سه ساله وقتی میگه بابا میخوام سر بابا رو برش بیاره بله میگه از خواب بیدار شد عمه عمه اورید والدی عمه جان پدرم کجاست فرمود پدرت رفته مسافرت گو بله میدونم شما میگید رفته مسافرت ولی من بابا رو میخوام دیگه تحمل نمی کنم آه اونجا بود که میگن یهو دیدن خرابه شام پر نور شد چه خبره بله یه طبقی آورده روی طبقه یه پارچه است تا نگاه کرد گفت امه جان من کی گفتم غذا میخوام من بابامو میخوام گفتن اونی که تو میخوای تو همین طبقه پارچه رو وردار تو فقط پارچه رو وردار میبینیش تا پارچه رو ورداش هفت یا هشت تا کلمه نقل کردن حضرت رقیه اون شب گفت اما اول همه اینو گفت گفت اب اب اعدمت نلحیات آی بابا کاش من مرده بودم سر بریده یه تو رو نمیدیده <تصفيق> بعدش داد زد آخه یه بچه این سه ساله چقدر تحمل داره من نمیدونم داد زد گفت اب اب کاشکی چشمام کور بود تو رو نمیدیدم به این حالت و به این وز بعد داد زد فرمود بدر جان بابا جان من الذي قطع الرأس الشریف بابا جان کی سر تو رو بریده <تصفيق> من الذي خضب الشيب الشريف بابا جان كي محاسنت و پر خون کرده 
هی گفت و گفت و گفت یه جا من ندیدم که بگه بابا منم کتکم زدن عذیتم کردن ببین پاهم تول زده ببین پام خونی شده ابدا یک بارم شکایت نکرد عوضش چی گفت دنبالم دوید با درخم که بود با 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 جرم من چی بود با 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 جون با با جون شامی لبانش بابا حسین جان بابا حسین جان دیگه بابا نظر کن بر روی نیلی از پا لا حول ولا قوة إلا بالله العلي العظيم إنا لله وإنا إليه راجعون شب ختم مجلس و من واقعا وظیفه خودم میبینم که از تمام شما تشکر کنم واقعش وسیفه خودمه هیچ جنبه دیگه هم نداره هر کی که خدمت کرد هر کی که نوکری کرد هر کی هر کاری برای امام حسین کرد خدا انشاءالله خیرتون بده عجرتون بده توفیق خدمت سید الشهدا رو هیچ وقت از شما از شما اولادتون خانواده هاتون سلب نکنه انشاءالله خلاص شب ختم و ما مزدمونه میخواهیم یا ابا عبدالله مزد ما هم ظهور آقا امام زمان همونه بسم الله الرحمن الرحیم الهی به حق الحسین الشهید المظلوم الغریب العطشان العریان و بسمك العظیم الاعظم الاعز الاجل الاکرم یا الله یا الله یا الله یا الله یا الله اللهم عجل لوليك الفرج والعافية والناصر 
اللهم اجعلنا من أصحابه وأعوانه ومقوية سلطانه اللهم كن لوليك الحجة ابن الحسن وقائدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى وتمتعه فيها طويلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم اقض حوائجنا اللهم ارزقنا في الدنيا زيارة الحسين وفي الآخرة شفاعة الحسين واجعلنا من المنتقمين لدم الحسين تحت لواء المهدي من آل محمد اللهم اغفر لنا ذنوبنا كفر عنا سيئاتنا وفقنا لمراضيك وجنبنا معاصيك اللهم وارحم أمواتنا شهداءنا علماءنا اللهم وارحم من مات على الإيمان وعلى حب أمير المؤمنين في كل مكان إلى أرواحهم جميعا نهدي ثواب مجلسنا هذا وثواب سورة المباركة الفاتحة مع الصلوات اللهم صل